Hi, my name is Arthur Zachwitz. I'm executive editor with WWD. I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, digital event. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about digital identities, technologies that can help propel the success of beauty brands and retailers in these unprecedented times. We have uh, Bob Bernice, who's uh, from Avery Denison. He'll tell a little bit more about himself and what they do there. Uh, this event is being uh, recorded and it'll be available for playback later. Um, the, the deck that you see, I know we get a lot of questions if the deck is available. Yes, this deck will be available. You could follow up with um, uh, Bob later on. We'll have a Q&A also, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the session. But you could ask questions using the chat feature, uh, which is located on the left uh, of the presentation. So you could, you know, ask questions throughout as they come up, and then we'll try to get to them. If we don't get to your question, well, uh, I'm sure Bob and his team will, will gladly follow up with you at the end. Uh, his contact information is uh, available then. We'll be having some polls also throughout the uh, the session. So, um, you know, get ready to put your thinking cap on and uh, we'll be polling some questions uh, your way. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bob and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming on today. Thanks, Arthur, and uh, thanks to WWD for having us. And uh, welcome, everybody. We're um, happy that you're here. Um, just prior to the call, and this is usually bad luck, somebody tells you how many people have signed up for an event or how many have attended, but one of my colleagues did that nonetheless, and it reminded me of a, a story. My brother's a musician, and one of the first times that he played years ago, um, six people showed up to the show, and uh, fortunately, he was with a friend who was a veteran musician, and, and he said to him, um, how do I play to six people? And uh, his friend said, the same way you play to 10. So... You know, I'm, we're glad you're all here. We hope that there's more than 10 people. We know there are, and uh, let's get at it. So a bit about Avery Dennison. Um, we are a global material science company specializing in the design and the manufacture of a wide variety of labeling and functional materials. And our intelligent labels business offers a suite of digital identity technologies that provide tracking and inventory solutions. They authenticate product history, and they conjure up a richer consumer experience. Digital has long been important for beauty, um, and the most common applications are ones you're familiar with, with that help people make shopping decisions. But purchases are also transacted through digital e-com platforms. The compelling influence of digital before COVID-19 has only been amplified by the pandemic. And the goal of this webinar is to introduce a new concept for digital a unique item level digital identity that can drive retail and operational successes for beauty brands and retailers during and after COVID-19. So as Art said, we're gonna put you to work right away. Um, and Arthur, if you can introduce this and work through it, I'd appreciate it. Sure, so uh, our first uh, question is, how do you primarily use digital in your current role? Uh, a would be uh, for influencer outreach, and driving engagement on social. Uh, B is for inventory management and supply chain visibility. Uh, C is for virtual reality and augmented reality. D would be to create apps for consumers. And E would be to deliver against sustainability and traceability goals. That's a good one. And F is uh, to apply a digital identity to your physical products. So uh, I'm gonna guess which one is gonna be uh, the most, let's say, let's say B. I don't know. What, what do you think? You're asking me? Yeah, B. I'm going to guess B. I don't know. I'm just. Dude, I'm not going to gainsay you. You you go with it. <laughs> All right. So uh, as the polls are coming in, we'll uh, we'll see where everybody is. And they're coming in. We have, um, oh, um, for influencer, Outreach and driving engagement on social, uh, we, we have about a third of the responses in so far, but that's trending as the number one so far. Oh. We'll, we'll wait a little bit. Still number one. And uh, for inventory management, it's number two, with about 19%, I guess. And then uh, to deliver against traceability and um, sustainability uh, goals. Uh, is looking like it's third. So I think that's it. I think we're... So a couple of, uh, still coming in. We have, we have about half people voting. Okay. So, um, so that's, yeah. So I think, um, right. So for influencer outreach, uh, it's about 36%, followed by uh, 
31 percent for to apply digital identity to physical products and then for inventory management and supply chain visibility so i was completely wrong <laughs> but um you yeah made, you made a good attempt maybe i made a good try okay cool well you know the influencer outreach um it's not surprising most people think about uh these types of things as as i mentioned earlier uh, to help people make purchasing decisions so um Moving ahead, I was uh, fortunate to attend an event in 2018 where Jean-Paul Egan, the, uh, the CEO of L'Oreal, was interviewed. And I wrote down this quote as you see it. We announced in 2010 that it would be the year of digital at L'Oreal. We just didn't know what that meant. So uh, Monsieur Egan talked about this digital transformation in 2010, but even at that time with some uncertainty about what it meant. And speaking of uncertainty, um, you know, the, the, the title of this presentation uh, refers to unprecedented times. I guess by definition, all times are unprecedented, but some are plagued by, by chaos and it creates deep uncertainty and even existential fear. And this is clearly one of those times, but we were struck by the hopefulness of uh, this cover of uh, the April issue of Italian Vogue April in Italy was one of the worst places in times for COVID-19. But even then, the editors expressed uh, hope for what was to come, certainly for society, but also for fashion and for other things uh, that make the world beautiful. And I've always liked this quote by the philosopher Nietzsche, but I find it particularly resonant now. He said, you must have chaos within you to give birth to a dancing star. And that, that gives me hope during these times. Um, so does this. I also heard uh, uh, Wendy Liebman give a, a, a talk earlier this year, and she made this exact quote, the transforming power of a great lipstick means you can do anything, anywhere, at any time. And apparently this is something that her mom told her. So this really struck me. Lipstick, makeup, skincare, and other beauty self-care routines, they're empowering. They're nurturing, enriching, uplifting, and they help people face chaos, even in uncertainty. And we're reminded that even during wartime, people buy lipstick. So there are numerous legacy challenges facing beauty brands and retailers, but we've identified two that we believe are particularly imposing. We'll regard these challenges through pre and post COVID lenses, and then we'll consider how digital identities applied to individual beauty products can address these challenges. And the two challenges are seamless shopping, merging physical and digital retail worlds, and supply chain visibility, or the lack of end-to-end -end item level visibility. Beauty shopping includes discovery, testing, purchasing, and certain digital tools have become common and indeed indispensable for uh, shopping beauty. One is influencers. Um, and in fact, we saw from our poll results, people put high uh, recognition of digital and influence on digital and influencers. They, they drive purchasing habits through social media. It kills me that most of these people were not famous before, and but now are wildly famous and indeed quite wealthy for uh, showing people how to use uh, products. Um, but the other is AR tools, try on tools, uh, virtual reality like Ulta Beauty's Glam Lab or L'Oreal's Modi Face. These were popular before. But let's take a closer look at how beauty products are purchased. Um, we'll do this by comparing the beauty physical and digital fulfillment channels. Um, we're, we're very uh, well versed at Avery Dennison as, of what's happening in the uh, retail apparel world. So for apparel stores, Sales were shrinking about two and a half percent year over year for the past six or seven years. At the same time, though, digital sales, e-com sales were growing by 17 percent. That means every four plus year years, digital sales were doubling. And it was in a market that was only growing by about 0.3 percent. So just very, very modest, modest growth. But when you look at beauty and in particular, we're looking at color cosmetics here. Store sales only uh, decreased by about 0.8% a year. So they basically were flat, but there was also a very large uh, increase in the amount of e-com purchasing, 14%, in a market that's growing pretty robustly, 2.5% uh, 
at GDP, maybe slightly above G GDP for some country, uh, for some countries. <clears throat> so stores were the primary channels for beauty shoppers. And, and indeed, it makes sense. They're tactically experiential. You can go in, you can try it, feel it, look at it. It, it, they mimic what beauty products deliver. Um, this is really interesting. Um, McKinsey reports that 80% of cosmetics and skincare purchases on average were store influenced. That means no matter how they were purchased, either in the store or e-com or some other uh, channel, they were influenced by stores. But at the same time, we see that uh, beauty shoppers are increasingly comfortable buying through e-com. So we're going to use this term, the new normal, to talk about, and everybody's using it, so I'm sure that you're quite familiar with it, um, to what's happening with COVID and after COVID. So we've talked about seamless here, um, and COVID-19 had no seamlessness to it at all, but rather it was a, a violent takeover of physical beauty retail by digital. And of course, we had the exclusive reliance of digital for try-on and testing, um, if stores were open and most weren't, you couldn't go in and, and use a tester. And indeed, the future of testers is in, 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 in great question. For example, UCAM, UCAM, uh, UCAM Makeup uh, reported a big spike in uh, virtual daily try-ons, and other platforms did as well. And more con content was generated by influencers and reached a greater audience of people who presumably are sitting at their computer now more than ever, much like I am now. Um, but it also caused a complete instantaneous prioritization of e-commerce uh, purchasing over physical. And there are manifold statistics that show this prioritization. And we have a couple here in our presentation. Here's the deal. Beauty, beauty stores will regain importance. They will. And we're seeing evidence of this in China as things recover and as shoppers return to stores. But even now, digital exclusive brands like uh, Beekman 1802 or Necessaire, they're looking to align themselves with brick and mortar partners like Ulta Beauty and Sephora, because even though they were digital natives, they want to have a physical, pre a pre physical pre presence. So stores have to adapt to this uh, new fulfillment techniques, you know. Certainly buy online pickup in store was, was gaining traction with beauty, but how about buy online pickup at curbside? Um, the bottom line here is beauty purchasers now have a heightened expectation of this seamless physical digital shopping experience. And this expectation will only deepen with and after COVID. IHL reports that 1.8 trillion U.S. dollars represents the value of the gross variance. This is overstocks and understocks throughout the entire global retail supply chain. $1.8 trillion, which is roughly equivalent to the GDP of Canada. And this was before COVID-19. Now, we know from the work that we've done with beauty retailers that they are inventory accuracy challenged. Pre-COVID-19, Inventory distortions we saw on average were somewhere in the 50% range, sometimes a little better for retailers that did um, cycle counts of certain brands or areas, worse for others. Um, what that distortion means that if you do a physical inventory at the beginning of the year, which things normally are done, and you let the inventory distort over the course or you let it run over the course of the year where purchases are made, receipts are brought in, in one year, that distortion means uh, how wrong you are before, you know, compared to what you actually have. So 50% means that you're wrong one out of two times uh, with what you believe you have and what you think, uh, what you actually have. The other thing that we've, we've learned is, at least anecdotally, omnichannel beauty retailers, they've struggled mightily to swap the physical inventories for the digital for the digital demand that that occurred with COVID, but even in less chaotic times, beauty retailers they're going to continue to struggle in satisfying the appetite of shoppers for seamless and instantaneous omnichannel product availability if inventories aren't accurate. The lack of end to end uh, item level visibility in supply chains has created three challenge areas. 
flexibility, security, and sustainability. The fresh and varied assortment of products is a key driver for beauty sales, particularly for color cosmetics. Um, the number of color cosmetic SKUs, for example, increased on average about 5% per year um, through 2018, about that, that way through 2019, even as color cosmetic sales were starting to suffer a little bit while skincare sales were on the rise. With respect to the new normal, COVID-19 has caused a massive shift in the types of beauty products customers are buying and not buying. For example, sales of prestige cosmetic products, they plummeted while do-it-yourself beauty sales, they soared. Hair coloring, men's grooming, and nail polish. And this one was really cool. I was thinking, well, nail polish is inexpensive, it's easy to apply, but people were washing their hands a lot. Nails were getting dried out and damaged, and it was an easy way to uh, in a in a, uh, a a way to cover this up. Um, an interesting exception was Alibaba reported a hundred and fifty percent increase in China of, of eye makeup during COVID, uh, presumably because eye makeup can be seen above the mask. And there's an expectation that the repeat of behaviors that occurred in previous difficult times, particularly the Great Recession, will re be, re be repeated now, where fewer uh, prestige products are bought and more mass and mastige products are, are purchased. Um, in general, we all know that beauty tends to suffer less during times of economic hardship. And Leonard Lauder co coined the phrase, the lipstick index or the lipstick effect. Beauty supply chains were already vulnerable with respect to maintaining flexibility to provide new products, fresh assortments and novelties without creating, and this is important, without creating worsening conditions in other aspects of the supply chain or in retail. We'll discuss that a little bit later. But COVID-19 further exposed these vulnerabilities. We're experiencing more than one crisis, uh, at least in the U.S., and we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the current focus on social inequality around race. Beauty isn't exclusive to one race or one gender or one identity, and everybody has the right to express themselves through beauty. Even before the crisis, though, there was a proliferation of skin toner and, ge and gender-inclusive products, both in mass and prestige segments. Target, for example, recently boosted its, exor its, its assortment of uh, medium and darker skin tone products. And I think everybody's aware of the popularity of Fenty Beauty, which is Rihanna's line of beauty products, which are gender and skin tone inclusive. And I just read yesterday that Fenty's introducing a, a, a line of skincare. So look out, everybody. And this is kind of interesting. It's the need for supply chain and product flexibility driven by social change. Ensuring beauty products are authentic, safe, and have been purchased through approved channels is probably, probably the most significant and serious challenge for uh, supply chain visibility. We're talking about security here, obviously. And security has two tracks, product authenticity and channel authenticity. For product authenticity, Beauty is clearly among the highest counterfeit products in the world, particularly color cosmetics. Now, statistics are hard to find, and we think that's because fear can lead to, uh, because of the fear of this leading to additional exploitation of counterfeits. But if you really want to be scared, check out some of the, the programming that's been recently on the BBC and on Netflix about the prevalence of, of counterfeit color cosmetics and the damage that it does. It's pretty much, it's, it's eye-opening. Um, counterfeit beauty products can create very serious health and safety risks, and with that, attendant liability to brands. And they also cause tremendous harm to brand equity. Now, turning to channels, genuine products are often diverted from legitimate to illegitimate channels, and they're often sold at a discount and certainly with zero control to any of the products. Over half of the Google shopping ads for brand specific salon products are for gray market channels. Through gray market channels, brands lose control again of product quality, of pricing, even their own narrative, again, causing certainly potential liability, but very certainly damage to brand equity. 
Now, the value of all this damage, nobody really knows, uh, or it's not public and it may not even be known, but the loss due to insecure supply chains is estimated to be in the multiple billions of dollars annually. This is globally, of course. The new normal for supply chain uh, visibility, it's pretty simple. Most counterfeit and gray market products are discovered and or purchased online. One study found that 82%, 82% of products were discovered on popular social media platforms. And that same study found that 45% of the products were purchased on popular e-com marketplace platforms. So we all know that digital platforms were the principal, if not the sole channels for beauty fulfillment during COVID-19. And this groove is gonna stay deep even after it subsided. Redpoints who did this study, they advised, this is really key, that 50% of respondents believe it's the brand owner's responsibility, not the platform, the brand owner's responsibility to remove counterfeits from online platforms. So this is this responsibility fall, falls to the brand owner. So it's safe to surmise that beauty brands and retailers, they're gonna continue to suffer greater damage at the hands of counterfeit and gray market products sold over digital channels during and certainly after COVID. Now, assuming a product is authentic and purchased through an approved channel, are the ingredients harmful? Are they toxic? Clean beauty was important pre-COVID-19 with statistics showing that clean being a primary purchasing criterion, regardless of demographic. Now, during COVID-19, self-care regimes focused on health and wellness, but there was also a hypervigilance about safety. Not only is what's in my product safe, but also has it been handled safely. And there's evidence that there were increases in sales of clean beauty, even during COVID, while general beauty sales suffered greatly. Sustainability is a top initiative for many beauty re, uh, brands and retailers, not only because they wanna be good corporate citizens, but also because customers in the market are demanding it. Now the standard unit for communicating environmental impact is metric ton equivalents of carbon dioxide. These are uh, greenhouse gas emissions. In 2018, the greenhouse gas emissions reported by L'Oreal and Unilever combined alone exceeded 25 million metric tons. Now these contributions come from sourcing raw materials, manufacturing, distribution, disposal. And they're on a similar scale to what we see for the global fashion industry, which in general means it's significant. Now it's important to point out that both L'Oreal and Unilever have ambitious and admirable goals for a reduction of greenhouse gases in their environmental footprint. But another thing to consider is that enormous quantities of plastic are attributable, attributable to beauty packaging. Cosmetics, uh, color cosmetics primarily, typically those packages, primary packages aren't recyclable. And if they are, they often aren't. Overproduction in the resulting inventory glut uh, in beauty is a legacy problem, particularly for color cosmetics, where high skew counts deliver variety, variety delivers sales, but the velocity of these products is slow. So it tends to lead to overstocking in waste of either expired products or products that are simply out of novelty or, or season. Um, many of you likely have seen the TikTok video where uh, an employee was showing the destruction of returned products now uh, at a particular retail. Now, um, in fairness, this is products that were returned uh, for the most part that were already open. And of course, those need to be destroyed from a safety standpoint. But you may also remember the chagrin that one high end luxury beauty retailer received when they actually published how much product in their annual report they destroyed primarily for brand protection. These were products that were returned to, to, to the vendor and they were destroyed so that they didn't end up in the supply chain. It's simple. If your brand isn't prioritizing sustainability, then you're in danger of disappointing a significant number of your existing and potential customers. We did an estimate using publicly available information and industry accepted practices of the annual uh, greenhouse gas impact of overproducing by 5%, just 5%, a single popular shade of one lipstick brand. 
What we found out is the CO2 and the equivalent CO2 emissions equaled that of 223 passenger cars delivered for a year. That's a small neighborhood of cars driven for, for a year. And that would require a forest almost the, twice the size of Central Park to sequester or absorb that carbon dioxide. And what's really interesting about lipstick is that this particular formula, and indeed most formulas for lipstick, they don't contain palm oil, the harvesting and processing of which extracts an enormous toll on the carbon economy. I think that this quote by Alex Keith, the uh, Procter & Gamble uh, beauty CEO, nicely summarizes this heightened need for a sustainable beauty world post COVID-19, but it also provides some hope around the prospects of how quickly and effectively we can transform this world. So now we're gonna put you to work again. We've taken a tour of two legacy challenges to beauty, seamless shopping and supply chain visibility with its sub challenges of security, sustainability and flexibility all of which were intensified by COVID-19. So we'd like to know from you, which of these challenges most resonates with you? So, so the um, A uh, would be merging physical and digital worlds. Uh, choice B is connecting e-com and physical retail channels. Uh, C is excess inventory. D is waste and throwing away expired stock. Uh, e is counterfeiting and gray market diversion and F is supply chain visibility. So please, please vote. And as the votes are coming in, uh, yeah, I just want to say that that was a remarkable amount of uh, the, the data, uh, eye-opening data. Uh, Bob, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, I'm, I took a lot of notes, so hopefully we'll do some follow-up uh, again and, and, you know, just a remarkable amount of uh, uh, you know, information. And what was intriguing was the the distortion on the supply chain, on the uh, inventory. That was just uh, shocking. But okay, so we have uh, votes coming in now. Let's see where we got. We got about twenty five percent of the people voting. Um, we'll see how. We'll wait till it gets to, to be about forty percent, and then we'll we'll start uh, seeing which is number one. Uh, so far, all right, we've got about 40% votes in. So at um, 33%, we have merging physical and digital worlds as the uh, issue most uh, resonating with our attendees today, followed by connecting e com and physical retail channels with about 22% of the votes. And then with um, 13% is supply chain visibility. Uh, and followed neck and neck, we have excess inventory and waste and throwing away excess stock. And then followed by counterfeiting and, and gray market uh, diversion. So, I, noticed you, I noticed you didn't place a bet, Art. No, not this time. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what's interesting, I think that's interesting. It's the uh, emerging, the di digital convergence. Uh, you know, we, we talk about this all the time, but, it, you know, putting into practice, uh, and making sure that you know your inventory is is managed well. It's it's not, uh, it's, I, you know, it's 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 hard. It's a challenge, right? Yeah, it is. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But for for the moment, let's return to uh, Monsieur Egon, and recall what he said in 2010 about digital and its meaning. He said this was the year of digital for us at L'Oreal. We just didn't know what it meant. This is what he said in April of this year. The current crisis has led to a strong acceleration of the digital transformation. So it's clear that Monsieur Egon's digital, uh, view of digital and its transformative power uh, have become crystallized. It's Avery Dennison's considered belief that a digital transformation for beauty lies in the addition of a unique digital identity at the item level. This identity created when the lipstick or palette or whatever item is manufactured, and we use the term born digital, travels with it from the factory through the supply chain to retail and beyond. The identity, this is what really makes it work, the identity is access to communicate information about the presence, the authenticity, the location, um, or even to transfer information to consumers. And it exists even after the product has expired. So in effect, it can be considered the, the soul of the item. 
this is one of my favorite uh, data points. Uh, having been an RFID for a long time and, and been around when this, this actually occurred, in 1999, Kevin Ashton, uh, the pro a product manager at Procter & Gamble, couldn't understand why a, a certain shade of an Olay lipstick couldn't be kept in stock. He asked supply chain, he asked retail, and nobody had a satisfactory answer. So he was thinking at the time, well, we're starting to put chips into things to identify them, smart cards and other things. Why can't we do this for lipstick and consumer products? So he went to his management at P&G. They were very supportive in his subsequent um, queries and partnerships with academia, um, other companies, other institutions. It led to the very standards that exist today around uh, a digital identity, RFID, that's widely being adopted by uh, to improve inventory accuracy by apparel retailers and brands like Target and Macy's and Decathlon, H&M, Fast Retailing, Adidas, the list goes on and on. So to this day, 21 years later, Kevin Ashton remains known as the father of the Internet of Things. Um, and to me, the concept of a digital identity for retail, it started with beauty and it's become full circle. So let's talk a little bit about some of these identities and how they apply. There are two key attributes that make a digital identity suitable to meet the beauty challenges of seamless shopping and supply chain visibility. One is the identity level. What that means is, is it an item level identity or is it otherwise? The other is communication. How does a reading device or a reader access the digital identity? Is it one-to-one -one where the reader can only access one digital identity at a time or can it access multiple identities over time? Is it line of sight or is it non-line of sight? Does the reader actually have to address the digital identity to read it or can it read it remotely? And finally, is it short range or is it far range? So let's look at some of these digital identity candidates. The linear barcode, it's applied to every retail beauty product that's out there for, for checkout and uh, even for case level logistics. It's SKU level. So what that means is if you have 20 items of a, a certain brand and color of lip liner in front of you, they will have a digital identity, but it will be the same for every one of them. And that's the, um, the uh, uh, UPC code, okay? Um, also, they're read one-to-one. -one. one barcode reader reads one device, okay? And the other is it's line of sight. You have to see it to read it. And it's pretty short range. You can get some distance to read it. Uh, so in general, while a mainstay for POS and for case level logistics, for the beauty challenge, it, it lacks the suitability and the uniqueness um, also you know, based on its com communication inflexibility. You can only read one at a time and you really have to be kind of close to read it. The next is a QR or a quick response code. And this is often a tool for consumers to interact with products through their smartphone. It's also one-to-one. -one. It's also line of sight. Think about accessing a QR. You actually have to look at it with your camera. QRs carry more data and they also can be serialized to create an item level identity, unlike uh, the linear barcode, which tends to be just a SKU level identity. There's increasing use by consumers of QR codes. And for example, Shiseido is using a QR on some of its NARS brand product to initiate a game in Japan. So the item level uniqueness lends utility for beauty security challenges, particularly post-purchase around authentication, but only for one item at a time. And it lacks this mass supply chain uh, uh, applicability. Now I've grouped the next uh, technology, optical technologies together, but specific examples include invisible digital watermarks or invisible barcodes. Another is high resolution imaging, capturing a beauty package's imperfections, digitizing that and creating a digital identity. Primar primarily, these are one to one, one reader, one digital identity, and they tend to be line of sight. But like QR, the digital identity can be item level which makes them again suitable for authenticity checks, but, but also one item at a time and not 
uh, on a mass level where items can be read at a distance and multiple items read at a time in general. Next is near field communications or NFC. This actually is an RFID technology. It's a passive technology based on a protocol that was developed for contactless payments some years ago, but it was retooled for consumer applications to deliver small bits of data securely over a short distance. And the primary applications are around product intera interactions with your smartphone. This too is an item level digital identity accessed one-to-one, -one, think about it again, tapping uh, a, a, a NFC device and, and reading it. And um, it's a slight improvement over the other technologies because it's not really line of sight because it's a radio frequency uh, uh, technology, but it only offers proximity read from a few centimeters. And it's designed to be that way. Uh, NFC offers high security and there's strong utility around NFC for sensing in touchless applications, which have become of paramount import importance for beauty. Again, the communication for NFC was intended as one-to-one, -one, not for multiple items in parallel in a supply chain. UHF RFID, which we spoke of just a moment ago, it's widely used in apparel and footwear, and it's gaining, a, it's gaining attraction in other verticals like food and aviation and logistics. This is really the first one-to-many technology that we've talked about. One reader can access multi multiple digital identities at one time. It's a non-line of sight technology. The reader doesn't actually have to see the device at all. It can read items in a box or on a shelf over here. It has a long range capability, often a meter or more. And the digital identity is typically a serialized UPC. So let's return back to that, uh, that example before. Say you've got 20 tubes of uh, Charlotte Tilbury Pillow Talk lipstick in front of you. They all will have the same UPC code, but with RFID, that UPC is serialized. So one item has a different uni unique digital ID than the next one. And that's what allows you to access them and identify them individually. So with this contribution of attributes, the one-to-many, non-line of sight, long read, read range, and unique digital ID, it smooths the physical and digital retail seam with the ability, for example, to identify the entire inventory of a typical beauty store at the item level in a very short period of time. And that makes items available and products available for omni-channel fulfillment through any channel. And at the same time, it provides this parallel item level supply chain uh, uh, visibility, reading in bulk uh, and, uh, and remotely a lot of items. And this lends to flexibility to produce the right assortment of products, security to validate and authenticate products and channels, and sustainability to, preserve, to produce the right amount of products, saving raw materials, energy, and not to mention preserving work, uh, working capital. We have some case studies of digital identities that we want to share with you. They're not all related to beauty, but we hope that they're all interesting and, and illustrative. Last fall, uh, Ralph Lauren Corporation launched its digital product identities program. Digital product uh, ID is a QR code assigned to the Polo product label at manufacture. And consumers can scan this with, a, with their smartphone to confirm that their purchases is authentic. Um, as well as to get uh, additional information about the product or the brand. And there's also some digital product, uh, also some uh, supply chain insights that can be supplied by this particular digital identity. Lululemon is one of the earliest adopters of unique digital identities uh, in the form of RFID for its performance and athleisure apparel. They add RFID to each item at the factory to ensure product availability through all channels. And we chose Lululemon here as an, as an example among many worthy apparel and footwear brands who've adopted RFID, primarily because they went public recognizing how the technology helped them meet the challenge of this drastic demand channel shift from physical to digital during COVID-19. RFID gave them the visibility to energize that physical dormant 
uh, in stores uh, inventory to satisfy digital demand. Uh, a digitally native prestige skincare company was discovering its products for sale through unauthorized channels. And it added an RFID digital identity to individual items and associated those IDs to purchase orders of its retail partners. And then the brand went on these uh, uh, unauthorized channels and bought these items back. They identified the diverting retailers and they took remedial action. This is a great example of how an item level digital identity can lend increased security to beauty supply chains. Oop, too fast. Grupo Boticario is the second largest beauty supplier in Brazil with more than 4,500 points of sale. They have a complex supply chain and channels. They sell through stores. There's a lot of direct consumer uh, 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 purchasing still in Latin America, and they also sell through a growing e-com channel. And they hired Ernst & Young a couple of years ago to evaluate technologies to revamp their supply chain. RFID was selected and a subsequent uh, successful pilot was run that demonstrated a significant increase in inventory accuracy, near elimination of out of stocks and a healthy revenue uplift. This unique RFID identity gives Boticario the ability to maintain accurate item level inventories, providing a seamless beauty shopping experience. So in summary, we've discussed in some detail the legacy challenges facing uh, beauty retailers and brands. And these were all exacerbated by COVID-19. Seamless shopping, item level supply chain visibility. We've proposed that an item level digital identity can transform beauty by meeting these challenges. And more specifically, an item level RFID digital identity makes possible a more flexible, secure and sustainable beauty supply chain enabling seamless and absolute product availability through any retail channel now into whatever the new normal might become. So we have a final poll. We're gonna put you to work one more time. We've heard your thoughts and would like to hear from you. So take it away, Art. Sure, so the, the question is, uh, how do you believe adding a digital identity to beauty products will be most impactful? Uh, choice A is to provide improved inventory accuracy, sales uh, like Grupo uh, Batacario. B, to provide more supply chain uh, security. C is to provide more connectivity with customers directly via your brand's products. D is to give more flexibility with my inventory, such as the example you gave in Lululemon. And E is to help minimize uh, waste from expired stock or hidden stock. So if you would vote. Also, um, if you have any questions, we're going to we're going to hit the Q&A uh, session uh, portion of, the, of today's session. So just please just drop your questions into the uh, chat chat feature right there. And as we're getting responses back, the um, this is interesting. okay. So we, we have we have about let's see here about twenty three percent reporting so far it looks like um, coming in number one is to provide connectivity with my customers directly via my products we'll, we'll wait to get some more until we get about forty percent of those uh, you know people who are voting in uh, we'll, we'll see what's on top okay all right so. Um, yeah, uh, number one is to provide connectivity with my customers directly via uh, products. Uh, second would be to give more visibility to what you have in stock. And that's followed by to give you more flexibility with moving inventory, such as the Grupo uh, Botticario example. And then to help uh, maintain, maximize waste uh, from expired stock or hidden uh, or hidden stock. So that's um, well, yeah. actually that, that's minimize waste. So no wonder nobody voted for it. I was like maximize. <laughs> yeah, you know, what's interesting, you know, we talked, you mentioned this, it, it sort of hits on all of those on um, sustainability, you know, controlling your inventory, protecting your brand, which is something I don't, you know, I never really thought about till you demonstrated that. So it's, um, 
it's remarkable. So, so please, yeah, we have some questions coming in. Please uh, use the the, uh, the chat feature to drop in your questions. Uh, and back to you, Bob. Sure. Th thanks, Art. So we're really pleased that you attended, and thanks again, uh, uh, WWD, for hosting this. And uh, again, we at Avery Dennison are really, really happy that you that you participated. Um, now we hope that you're considering adding a digital, uh, unique identity to your digital beauty toolbox. And I provided my contact information should any of you want to uh, continue the conversation one on one. Um, and we're gonna have some um, questions, but my final word is: until then, be safe and. Before we leave, I want to remind you of the two quotes that we heard from Wendy Liebman and uh, Nietzsche at the beginning of the presentation. Especially in these times of chaos, try not to forget to put on some lipstick, uh, either literally or figuratively, and go find a star to dance with. So thanks, Art. All right, so we have some uh, questions. Let's see. Um, we got a couple that's still coming in. All right, here we go. Uh, do you have an opinion on blockchain technology and its potential impact on protecting uh, digital identities? A absolutely. I mean, blockchain is a way to record these transactions and to do it in a way that's safe and secure. Blockchain will play an, a very important role in, in, in uh, securing, uh, providing access to these digital identities, not only in, in, in beauty, but also in food and, and, and other verticals. Hey, I have a question about blockchain, though. Isn't it, I mean, it's kind of tricky because the, the, what you put in is what you get out. So if you're putting not accurate information in, right, is that, is that true? You have to be careful about the inputting of blockchain. Yeah, it, it's really true. The good news about these digital identities are, are typically they're machine read. So, you know, you're, you're as good as the resolution and the accuracy of your, of your machine. So, but you, you make a good point. Uh, we, we have a question here. Uh, beauty products have uh, been seen as RFID, as unfriendly, as RFID uh, unfriendly, I guess, is the reputation. What has happened in terms of technology development to make it possible to use RFID? Certainly, yeah. There are, there are um, content uh, challenges, and then there are also packaging challenges. Uh, UHF RFID, um, we've, de we've developed... Uh, media that can work on liquids, which typically was a problem. The liquid would absorb the RF, but now we've been able to make two tags that are tuned that work very well. We can we can get that one meter plus read distance on liquid. The other challenge is metal. Metal tends to reflect RF technology, but we've also been able to come up with solutions for doing that. Either either media that can be applied directly to the metal in red very similarly to the way a standard RFID uh, item can be read, or also creative ways of removing the RFID element from the, uh, the metal without interfering too much with the packaging. So we have the utmost confidence that RFID can be read in beauty retail situations as well as it can be and has been done for the past 10, 12 years in apparel. Okay. Uh, we just have time for just a few more uh, questions. Um, here we have someone asking, aesthetics are important when it comes to beauty products and using RFID tag on products uh, can affect their appeal to a certain extent. How has this been tackled by various brands such as Bonacario? Car sure. Well, um, without giving away too much specific information, there's any number of ways of doing it. First of all, if you look at a lot of uh, beauty brands and color cosmetic brands, they're already labeled with the UPC label. Even, even you know, the, the typical sort of um, high color brand, black box brand with 72 colors, they often have a white label on them. So even the most basic RFID label is not going to be odious for that. But at the same time, this media can be converted into product labels that are decorated and you don't detect the RFID element. There's also the possibility of putting the RFID element in the primary package, even in the inside of the box, so that it's not seen by the outside, but it, it, it can be accessed. There's a number of ways of doing this. But the important takeaway here is I think that's a default response by brands a lot, and it's true. But there's a lot more labeling that happens, even in prestige beauty, than people realize. We, uh, I'm 
we're running out of time and I want to be respectful, um, but I am going to ask one more question uh, today. And then if you, if you know, if we don't get to your question, please follow up. Uh, also the, the deck is available. You follow up with, uh, uh, with Bob. Uh, and before I turn it over um, for Bob for a final thought, one last question. How do you see um, the stores, the physical stores changing in a post COVID world? What, how, what's that going to look like? I, I don't know. I th well, I think it will look a lot like it does now, but a lot of the hands-on operations will not be there. There won't be physical testers. Um, how, how beauty consultants interact with their, their customers are going to have to change as well. Can that be done as a, at a distance? Perhaps. But I think the drive to visit stores is certainly going to overtake that. And the ability to think about this and innovate by brands and stores is going to fix this. So I would say once we get to a point where we've dealt with this pandemic in a way that makes people comfortable visiting stores, I think it's going to look a lot like what it does now, but with more technology and more, more digital presence. Um, I don't have any more questions. And what, what is your contact information again? Can you share that? And sure. I think it's on one of the previous slides, but it's, it's uh, robert.pernice at averydenison.com. Yeah, let, let's see if we... Shall I find it? Oh, there we go. You got it? There you go. Right there. Robert.pernice at avdenison, one word, dot com. Correct. All right. Uh, thank you so much for attending today. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, I hope everybody stays well. Um, Bob, can you just give us uh, some final thoughts? Uh, stay healthy, buy beauty, feel good about yourself, and we'll all get through this. Thanks. Thank you.